Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, just got the recording started. So we are ready to go. Okay. So uh, let's uh, pray together and then uh, we will start. So the others will join us this morning and we'll have a good time. Um, and Romans, we're moving forward from uh, Romans chapter 8. Okay, uh, could one of us just uh, pray with the class and we will get started, please? Let's <clears throat> do this. Father, we, we thank you uh, for this day, Lord. Uh, we thank you how good you've been in our lives. Uh, Jesus, mm -hmm. we, Lord, we submit and surrender this uh, class into your hands, Father, for the next two hours. Lord, I pray that you will c continue to lead us, uh, Lord, and how beautiful you've been leading us, Father, in the past, three, in past weeks, Lord. Uh, we submit today's session into your hands, Lord. I pray that you will help us understand um, your word. Jesus, continue to pour out your wisdom over us, Father. I pray for Pastor, even as he teaches us, Lord. Uh, Lord, continue to guide him as you have been. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we are in Romans 8. Now, a very beautiful chapter. We stopped at verse um, 17. That's kind of how far we went. I uh, will just quickly review, and then we will go forward from uh, there. So we we spent a lot of time actually last week uh, in these just just looking at this first 17 verses of Romans 8. Um, we we talked about how Paul, uh, as he's unfolding uh, the teaching here, uh, shares his uh, own personal experience in Romans chapter seven. Uh, but it's not limited to his own experience. It's uh, you know it's general. It's for every person who desires to do good from the inward man, but uh, struggles with uh, sin ruling in the body. And so when we begin in Romans 8, he says, this is the answer. Thanks be to God. Um, uh, the end of Romans 7, thanks be to, I thank God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Romans 8, here's the answer. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus because we walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And then he opens this whole dimension of life in the spirit um, for, to us as, as believers. He talks about the work of the spirit of life in us as believers, that the Holy Spirit, the spirit of life, the life-giving spirit, he sets us free from the law of sin and death. So we looked at the law of sin, which was what he had referred to earlier in Romans 7, the sin that controlled the flesh, uh, and death, which was the byproduct or the result of sin reigning in the body. So the Holy Spirit sets us free. However, it's important, as Paul continues, uh, he continued, he said, uh, we must be spiritually minded, not carnally minded. If we are carnally minded, it will only result in death. But when we are spiritually minded, it will result in life and peace. And then he talks about how uh, the Holy Spirit, indwelling the believer, he helps us put to death the deeds of our sinful deeds of our body. So we as believers, with the help of the Holy Spirit, do subdue sin and subdue the sinful deeds of the body. Then he tells us how the Holy Spirit um, leads us, that everyone who's, who's a child of God is led by the Spirit of God. And uh, he, the Holy Spirit, uh, one minute. Okay. Uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So we are led by the spirit. That's verse 14. 
uh, where the Holy Spirit dwells in us as a spirit of adoption, verse 15, verse 16, he bears witness with our spirit. And uh, then he says, if we are children, then we have this wonderful place of being heirs of God and joint as with Jesus. Now, you know, uh, just to spend time thinking about that, that verse 17, that the Holy Spirit coming into our lives uh, as a spirit of adoption, uh, making us children of God, really in the spiritual realm, has made us heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Uh, we have, uh, imagine in the natural, in the natural, if you and I were to, you know, be adopted in an earthly, into the family of an earthly king, who, uh, you know, a powerful king, that he gave us something that then qualified us to become an heir to that kingdom, joint heir with the one who is the first heir. So we become joint heirs. And in an earthly sense, you know, uh, that immediately puts us in a place of standing of great standing in an earthly sense. We become heirs, we become joint heirs, you know. Uh, and if the, the example that we could think of maybe is, you know, the monarchy and in, uh, in, in, uh, and I guess the most well-known monarchy would be that, that's still kind of continuing, uh, uh, would be that in, in England. Uh, and just imagine, it's not going to happen, but just imagine if we get, if one of us, you know, gets in there and becomes an heir or a joint heir. That, that puts us in a tremendous standing. But uh, this is what has happened in the spiritual realm. This is what Paul is bringing our attention to. He says, you know, the Holy Spirit coming in, like he, he's doing all this, right? He's the one who's helping us uh, overcome the law of sin and death. Uh, he's the one who's helping us crucify the sinful deeds of our body. Uh, he's the one who is leading us because we are children of God. He's the one who is the spirit of adoption. He's brought us into the family. He's the one who is bearing witness with our spirit. And because of that, we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus. So in the spiritual realm, that's our standing. Heirs and joint heirs. And it's perfectly fine to operate in that. God wants us to conduct ourselves as heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus in the spiritual realm. And so he says, you know, end of verse 17 is where we paused. He says, uh, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So, it's okay for us to suffer because we know we're going to be glorified with him. So there is a sense in which we are glorified now, but in which we do suffer now, in which we are glorified now. That means we are able to walk in this a wonderful privilege of being heirs and joint heirs. But there's also something up ahead that is going to unfold, which Paul now begins to share with us, starting from verse 18. Okay, so just a quick review. Let's move forward, please, starting from verse 18, Romans chapter 8. Uh, we're going to read verse uh, from verse 18. Uh, let's do 18 to 23. Uh, we look at that passage. Romans chapter 8, 18 to 23, please. Somebody could read it. For I consider that suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest experience experiences of the creation or eagerly wait of the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected 
to fulfill futility, futility not willingly but because of him who subjected in hope because the creation itself also be the deliver from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty liberty of the children of god for we know that the whole creation groans groans and labors with birth pain begins to thanks together until now not only that but we also who have the first fruit of the spirit even we ourselves groans within ourselves are are eagerly waiting of the adoption the re- redemption of our body okay thank you all right so this passage is quite unique because paul or what paul says here he doesn't share anywhere else uh, like many other things in romans what paul says here you don't find it anywhere else in any other episode so it's quite important uh, looking at these verses here in romans 8 uh, was was 18 we'll start with that so paul is saying you know the sufferings that we are going through today uh, right now they're not worthy to be compared to the glory which is going to be revealed in us and so he's pointing to a future glory so he says you know we are going to we are going through earthly sufferings now part of the sufferings that he, uh, he has already addressed in the preceding verses which we mentioned last time it has to do with crucifying the flesh so that that is suffering uh so that is part of the suffering but he says you know uh, and he's going to tell us a little bit more you know what what's the cause of suffering but he says you know the sufferings that we are going through in this present time it's nothing compared to the glory which is going to be revealed to us so this something glory glorious um, that's coming up verse 19 for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of god so he's saying even creation is eagerly waiting for the unveiling of the sons of god so we are already sons of god we are already heirs we are already joint heirs so that that is already done but there's something more that's coming up and even creation is looking forward to that it's going to tell us what it is it's going to tell us so even creation is looking forward to that verse 19 verse 20 for the creation was subjected to futility not willingly but because of him who subjected it in hope so now he's saying all of creation was subject to futility things that are futile vain empty or things that are you know and, and as he talks mentions in the next verse things that are actually destructive so creation was subject to it not willingly that means it wasn't this was not necessarily the will of god for it to happen but god let it go while he let creation be subject to this futile vain thing in hope because that means in anticipation of a future outcome is going to tell us what it is and i'll explain it i'm just going one verse by verse then we will uh, you know we'll put it all together verse 21 because creation itself also will be delivered so at that future time creation will be itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption 
into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So there's coming a time when even creation is going to be released from what? The bondage of corruption. That means at the present moment, when he said in the preceding verse that creation was given to, was subjected to futility. What was he referring to? This, uh, that is, creation right now is under the bondage of corruption. And I'll explain this. It's subject to bondage, under the bondage of corruption. But creation, this coming a time when creation itself will be delivered from this and be brought into the glorious liberty of the children of God. That means that the glorious uh, liberty, the great glory the children of God are going to experience, creation also will be brought into that. Right? I, will, I will explain. I'm just you know going step by step. Verse 22. For well, we know that the whole creation right now, creation, is groaning and laboring with birth pangs till now. It's almost like creation is going through such pain, but this pain he compares to that of a woman in labor. That means it's very intense, but it's also going to give birth to something. Something's going to come forth. The so creation is right now groaning and lay, you know, it's, it's an intense pain, but it's, it's a pain that is expecting something wonderful to happen. And not only that, but we also. So this is not just creation groaning, but even us, we people who have the first fruits of the Spirit. So he's talking about believers, that we believers who are the first fruits of the Spirit, that means the Holy Spirit is living in us, we also groan within ourselves. So we also are feeling the same, um, uh, you know, um, there is the suffering of this present time. So there is this groaning, but, we, verse 23, we are uh, we are also are looking forward for the adoption. And what is this he talking about? The redemption of our body. So this glorious liberty of the children of God, which he was talking about, is really the time when our, our, the redemption of our body, our physical body, will also be complete completely fully redeemed in the sense that mortal will put on immortality and that we will no more be subject to physical death. Okay, so what's, what is Paul telling us in this passage? So when Adam sinned, not only did Adam come in subjection to the devil, to Satan. But all, I mean, this earth, because God had put Adam in charge of this earth, this earth came in subjection to sin and Satan. And death. Sin, Satan, and death. Because through one man, sin came into the world, and death through sin. What is death? Death is decay. It's corruption. So this entire, all of creation at that time, in the fall, all of creation was subject to corruption. It came in bondage, like he says here in verse 21. It came in bondage or it, it came uh, in subjection to corruption. It's the working of death. It's a decay. It's a decline. It's a downward movement. It's a deviation from original design away from it. And it's a decline. So, for example, God never intended Adam and Eve to die physically. No. They were going to live in that body he had made for them forever. He never intended for them to die. But the moment they sinned, what happened? Death came into this world. And all of creation was subject to 
the bondage of corruption, all of creation, everything. And so if you look at Adam and Eve, their bodies were originally designed to live forever. They were not going to die. But now that sin came into the world and death through sin, their bodies began to de decline. And so eventually, after several hundred years, they died. And all the people who were born thereafter eventually died. Now, that was not God's original design. But because of sin, every created thing on this earth was subject to corruption. That means it began to deviate from God's original design, from the perfection of God's perfect state that it was supposed to be in, began to deviate. So that is why we find so many things that are imperfect, like it's not the way God originally designed it. So why example, and, and this helps us understand, you know, why, uh, for instance, take for instance, why are children born with birth defects? Now, of course, medically, the doctors will tell us, okay, this is what happened. Uh, maybe the gene that was supposed to mark for a certain thing that happened, uh, a certain organ or system in the body didn't, something went wrong, and therefore there was a problem. But there's, from a spiritual standpoint, now the doctors will explain to us from a, medical standpoint, which is fine. But from a spiritual standpoint, what has happened? Did God create or did God design defective genes or genetic code? No. Everything was perfect. But in the fall, all of creation was subject, came into the bondage of corruption, came into subjection to corruption, which is a deviation from God's original design. And so things started becoming, you know, corrupt. They're not being, they're not, they're no longer in the perfect standard decay. So our bodies were originally designed to live continuously, but now our bodies are mortal, they die. And so we can explain one aspect that for I'm going back to the same thing that hey when some when the child is born with defects with you know whatever uh, uh, abnormalities physical or so on we cannot blame God we can't say God made the child like that no. There's something else at work. All of creation is subject to the bondage of corruption. And it says that in verse 20, God subjected it. He let it go, not willingly. It means this is not what God wanted. This was not what God intended. But he let it go. It says, but because of him, that is God, who subjected it in hope. That means God said, okay, I'm letting it go now because this is what is the outcome of man's choice. But there is hope. What is the hope? That all of creation and all of us who receive the first fruit of the Spirit will experience the glorious liberty of the children of God, the will experience the uh, uh, the redemption of our body. That means everything, all of creation, including us, who are, we who have you know received the first fruits of the spirit, we will be 
redeemed, fully redeemed. So we are enjoying part of our redemption now, but there's still something we're looking forward to. Where even our bodies will be redeemed. Everything will be redeemed. So, looking at verse 18, Paul says, you know, the sufferings of this present time, the sufferings of this present time. So now we expand our understanding of the sufferings of this present time. What is it? It's sufferings that have come into this world because of the bondage of corruption. That all of creation is, you know, is in bondage to this. Uh, they are in, subject, in subjection to this. And this brings in a lot of suffering, of course. It's not easy. Uh, you know, people die prematurely, we say prematurely, meaning people die at all kinds of ages. That was not God's original design. Uh, you know, whether it's children or you know, a young person or whatever, you know, they, they die suddenly. Hey, they haven't even lived out 50 years or 60 or 70 years. They, this is not God's design. Uh, now all kinds of things happening, the sufferings of this present time. Why is it? Because all of creation is subject to the bondage of corruption. But God gave it up willingly because of hope that, you know, because he knows that there's coming this day and time when all of creation will be brought into this glorious liberty. It will be brought into this place of red, full redemption, that he will redeem all things to himself. Right? We can cross-reference uh, Colossians chapter 1. Uh, Aaron, I will, I will answer your question. Right? Uh, we'll just um, uh, look at a few cross-references to this. We go with me, please. Um, we can go to Colossians and um, chapter one, right? Yeah. Right. And um, we can look at verse 20. Colossians one, verse 20. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Hmm. Thank you. So what is God working towards? That is through Christ, he's going to reconcile all things to himself. And he's going to bring it all back. So Romans 8 says, he... Let it go, though not willingly. Let it go. Let it become subject to futility. Let it be subject to this bondage of corruption. He did it in hope. What is that? It says here in verse 20 that through Christ, and through that means through what Jesus did on the cross, the preceding verses, he will reconcile everything back to himself. He's going to bring it back. Whether things in heaven, things on earth, or things in heaven, they will be reconciled back to God. Right? And um, uh, verse uh, Ephesians 1 and verse 14, again, another cross reference to this. Ephesians 1, verse 14. Somebody could read that, please. Ephesians 1.14, somebody, please. Who is who the is, deposit? Who, Sorry, Siddharth, go ahead. Yeah. Who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's position to praise of his glory? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the Holy Spirit has been given as a deposit, as a guarantee, 
until that means there is something still more to come until the redemption of the purchased possession. So there's coming a time when there when this, you know you and I are the, are the purchased possession of God, but we are going to be fully redeemed. That this this body and all everything will be fully redeemed. So now we are walking in part in part of our redemption and we will physically die and all of that we know. But there is this there is coming this redemption of our body and uh, of the purchased possession. Right. So this passage helps us understand to some degree the sufferings. I'm going back to Romans 8, sorry. Romans 8, uh, 18 to 23. Some degree, the, the, the sufferings of this present time. You know, a lot of things happen. And you wonder why. Well, because all of creation is subject to the bondage of corruption. Why? Are, and then when you look at natural calamities, right? You have tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanoes destroying lives, um, the uh, you know, cyclones and tornadoes that are so destructive. I mean, did God? create like a world like this that is destructive? Did God create earthquakes and all, all these things to in, in his original design? No. Genesis chapter 1 and 2 tells us God saw everything was good. He was very happy. He said it was good. Not destructive, not things that would cause pain. So even creation, the, we read here that creation, verse 20, creation. So every created thing, life and non-life, material things, non-material things, everything was subject to this bondage of corruption. So why are there all these catastrophic natural events? And is God doing it? Is God causing the tornado? And sometimes, you know, uh, 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 it's very sad, but suppose, you know, there's a big cyclone happening somewhere or a volcano that destroys lives or earthquake that destroys lives. And people say that's a judgment of God. Well, we have to be careful before we say something like that because we do read in scripture that God did use natural elements at times to bring judgment. I'm not ruling that out. But not everything is an act of God's judgment because all of creation has been subject to the bondage of corruption. And some of the things that happen are not God using the natural element to cause judgment, but it is the deviation from God's best that's just taking place in the natural elements. Um, whether it's the wind or the waves or the earth. Because they've gone away from the, 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 it's deviating from God's original design. So It helps us understand some of these things that in creation, all of creation, because of sin, death came in. And death didn't affect just man, uh, the human race. It affected all of creation. So that everything is actually in a state that is away from God's original design. It's not in a state of, not in the st state of perfection the way God originally created it. But, and so that's why all the suffering is happening. But the hope that we have, and something Paul says, even, you know, creation is waiting for, 
is this glorious day when there will be the redemption of our body, there will be the glorious liberty of the children of God, when we will be brought into the fullness of redemption, when God will reconcile all things to himself. So, we are looking forward to it. All of creation is looking forward to it. Right? So, to answer some questions there, okay, Aaron's question. Uh, um, yeah, so, um, Aaron, your question is, you know, Children, people are not born normal, the special child, that they go to heaven. Uh, the Bible doesn't give us, I mean, there is no chapter and verse by which we can answer this question. Um, the What we can say is that because they don't have the ability to understand right and wrong and understand, uh, you know, to hear the gospel and so on. So they don't have that. So I think it would be safe to say that children, special children and so on, pe people are not born normal or don't have the capacity. It's safe to say that they would go to heaven. Uh, I, I, I I cannot, I, mean, I, I can't give you a chapter and verse, so I, I you know, I, I'm not saying this is t truth. I'm just saying uh, it, this is what would be safe to say. But uh, we will let God, dis I know, we will find out. We'll find out. God is the final judge and he will decide. Okay. Um, um so, with this in mind, I also want us to be careful when we are working with people that we don't um, attribute something to God. You know, um, so, so you know, example: if a baby dies. You shouldn't say God took the child or God, you know, God wanted the child to die young. Remember, it says here, not willingly. That's Romans 8.20. I mean, this is not God's will. Not willingly. This wasn't what he wanted. This was not his design. So... We shouldn't say, oh, God wanted it. No, no. Keep in mind, there's, there's many things that are happening here that is not the will of God, but is the outcome or the result of the creation being subject to the bondage of corruption. The death that came in because of sin and passed upon everything. So we shouldn't blame God for those things. Now, I'm not saying, you know, go and give a theological response <laughs> answer to somebody who's going through that suffering. No, the, just keep quiet. Don't go on. You know that, okay, this is not God. And um, uh, uh, it's not God and it's not uh, God causing it. Uh, but, you know, at that moment when somebody's going through grief and thing, that's not the time to bring up theology and try to, give fancy answers, so just keep quiet. Uh, but this, what I'm trying to stress is, you know, this is Romans 8, 18 to 23, explains a lot of the sufferings that we're going through this time. Yeah, so Aaron, I see your question here. So you want just to clarify, see, the uh, my, my response is that there is no chapter and verse by which we can, you know, say uh, you know, uh, clearly, definitely, right? Uh, I would point to, you know, Romans chapter 7 and verse 8, uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 9, and also would point to Matthew chapter 18, where Jesus talked about children, uh, right? Uh, 
and so we're saying that while there's no statement, direct statement from the scriptures saying that every child who dies will go to heaven, there's no direct statement. We are saying that uh, we think, I can just say, I think that children who die below the age of accountability, that is Romans 7 verse 9, before they came to understand the commandment, or Matthew 18, the angel, there's an angel, the child's angel is in the presence standing before God. I think it's Matthew 18, 10. Um, so that's what I'm saying. We think that children will go to heaven, right? There's no direct scripture. But based on these inferences, right? So to state it clearly, based on our understanding, and not based on chapter and verse, but based on our understanding, we think that children and those who are not able to understand the gospel, that is, you know, if there's, like you said, special children, when they die, they'll go to heaven. But, um, you know, what, what I'm saying is, we will leave, let God handle it. Uh, based on understanding, we're saying they'll go to heaven, but God will judge, make the final decision. So we leave it there. Okay. All right. Okay, any questions here? I know I spent a lot, little extra time here in Romans 8, uh, 18 to 23, because uh, it's something you don't see elsewhere in in, 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 in Scripture. So I thought we'll you know, explain it. And, and what are the ramifications, what are the implications of uh, what is being presented to us here. Any questions, any things you want to discuss before we move on, move forward? Okay. All right, so let's um, um, just read verses 24 on to um, 28. 24 to 28, please. Somebody could read that. Romans 8, 24 to 28, please. For we were saved in the hope, but hope that is seen in is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Hmm. Thank you. So, the context, the background is the sufferings of this present time. Caused partly because of creation being subject to the bondage of corruption. Now, uh, in addition to this, what the other things that cause suffering, of course, is the work of the enemy. Satan is at work. Then man is also doing a lot of evil, wicked things. So all this put together is causing a lot of suffering that's going on on the earth. Right. So there are people who are wicked, who do wicked things. They think up wicked schemes and kill and destroy and People do that. And then there's Satan and demonic spirits also at work, right? So all these things are causing suffering. But then we have this hope. We are waiting for the redemption of our body. And so verse 24 and 25, Paul says, you know, it's something we can't see yet. Right? Because if you can see it, then you don't have to hope for it. So we can't see it. So that's why we have hope. Hope means it's out there in the future, 
We know we're going to have it, but it's still in the future. The only thing we can do, like he says in verse 25, is we wait for it with perseverance. That means we have patient endurance and we wait for it. It's out there in the future. We hope for it. And interestingly, at this time, he transitions into prayer. So he says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. So there's the weakness he's talking about. What weakness is he talking about? In the overall context, the weakness is the weakness of our flesh. Because that is the overarching theme, starting from Romans chapter 6 and chapter 7 and chapter 8. The overarching theme, theme is, hey, there is the weakness of our flesh, which we, we cannot overcome on our own. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's going to help us. So it's almost like between 18 to 25, Paul has taken a little detour to talk about, to give us a little understanding of the sufferings of this present time that is caused by this bondage of corruption, but giving us hope that there is this glorious liberty of the children of God. And then he's coming back to this theme of the weakness that we are contending against. So we have to put it in the context of all that he's been talking about, which is the weakness of our flesh. So he says, likewise, the whole Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. So at the highest level, the overarching theme of what Paul has been speaking to us, it's the weakness of our flesh. But in the immediate preceding context, which he just mentioned, it is the sufferings of this present time. That is, there are times when we're going through the sufferings of this, this journey through life. And we feel weak. And we don't know what to pray for. So God, what do I pray for? So whether it's the weakness of our flesh or whether it's journeying through the sufferings of this present time, which Paul just mentioned, saying we have to persevere through, we have to have patient endurance to go through. There are times when we say, God, I don't know what to pray for. So the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that he's introduced us to, you know, from verse 1, the same Spirit who helps us, he helps us in our weaknesses because we don't know what to pray for at times. And the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us. This is in verse 26. I'm looking at verse 26. We don't know what to pray for, but this is where the Holy, Holy Spirit comes in. And he himself makes intercession with groanings which cannot be uttered. So the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us and what he does, he does with us or through us. And these are, this is prayer, intercession of course, that is expressed through groanings which cannot be uttered. That means there is an expression that's coming from the Holy Spirit. It is actually intercession, but it is coming in the form of groanings that cannot be expressed through our speech, cannot be uttered. But obviously it's groanings, so it has, somebody has got to express it and somebody's got to speak it out and then you look at verse 27 it says he who searches the hearts so now it's coming back to the individual god who looks into the hearts so where are these groanings being coming are uh, being released from 
the heart of the believer. So this prayer, this intercession that helps us in our weaknesses comes from the Holy Spirit, but it's released through our hearts or our spirits. And these are groanings which cannot be expressed through our own words. But God looks into the heart. And it says, verse 27, He knows what the mind of the Spirit is. That means He knows what the Holy Spirit is saying. Because that intercession is intercession for the saints. So who is having weakness? Not the Holy Spirit. It's the saint. Who's helping in prayer? And, and the saint doesn't know what to pray for. Who's helping? The Holy Spirit. How is he helping? By making intercession. But who's doing the intercession? The, be the, the believer with the help of the Holy Spirit. Where is intercession coming out from? The heart of the believer. Who's, looking, who's listening to it? God. He looks into the heart of the believer. He knows what the Holy Spirit is saying. What is the mind of the Spirit? And this intercession, verse 27, is according to the will of God. That means where the believer doesn't know what to pray for, the Holy Spirit is helping him pray according to the will of God. It's coming out as groanings, meaning it's, it's prayer that's coming from the Holy Spirit. It's being expressed, um, you know, in in inarticulate speech, it's, it's not something the believer thinks up. Uh, it's a groaning that could be expressed in so many ways, whether it's uh, expressed in tongues or whether it's expressed through crying and weeping or whatever fashion. The Holy Spirit is releasing it through the life of the believer. It is some. It results in prayer that is according to the will of God, and it results in help helping the saints, helping the believer in our weaknesses. So Romans 8, 26, 27 is a key verse uh, that talks about overcoming weakness. Right? I will just come back. We'll take a break. I know it's time. Uh, so we'll take a break. Let's come back. Spend a few more minutes on 26, 20, Romans 8, 26, 27, and then we will move forward. Okay? Uh, all right. Let's take a quick quick break. Uh, we'll be back. Um, I'm intentionally moving a little slow here because this is a very, very, uh, uh, you know, uh, intense chapter. But and, and we really need to, you know, get all the juice out. So uh, we'll pick up speed. Okay. Thank you. God bless. <laughs> 